Welcome back to American PSYOP, a podcast miniseries in nine parts. I'm Emily Bix, continuing my conversation with Wesley Clark Jr. and our attempt to figure out what happened to him. So to recap, last time you had arrived at Standing Rock and soon after you got there, the protest was a success. The pipeline lost. But then almost immediately after that, you are told you're going to be killed So today we're going to focus on the last half of your stay at Standing Rock. This was the time you and the thousands of veterans you had brought in were going to take the front line of the protests. But as we said, the protest was already a success, so there wasn't much left to do on that front. The only thing I was supposed to do was the forgiveness ceremony that Phyllis had set up where I would ask forgiveness for the atrocities committed on the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota peoples by the U.S. military. Up to this point, the people around you have been pumping you up, telling you how special you are, but that's about to change. Do you think that the buildup left you open to being influenced? Of course it does. The buildup gets you to the point where then it can be all taken away. Okay, and when we left off, right after the easement is denied, you are told by Sanderson, a member of your group, veteran Stan, that you are about to be killed and you leave for the casino. And then Travis brought you up to a room where he said you would be safe, but you said the way he moved and the massive tattoo on his chest made you nervous. Then what happened? Yeah, so I left the room. Even though he said you were going to be killed? Yeah, because he he said a Native American organization was trying to kill me, and I was a lot more nervous about everyone who wasn't a Native American. I was worried about infiltrators, not the people who were actually from the reservation. So I just left the room walk around the hotel a lot to go from room to room to room. I heard Mike Wood, who was a co-founder with me, a veteran stand, finally got in. So I stopped by Mike Wood's room and he was hanging out with the guy that Seven had said was an infiltrator and his wife and a couple other people. And they were just like, you know, kind of felt like a party. So I moved on, checked on a couple other different groups of people, made it back. I think I slept for about an hour and a half and I knew the next day we were going to have a ceremony. So I got about two hours of sleep, got up, was able to eat breakfast in the cafeteria of the hotel with everybody else. And then they had the apology ceremony. They were going to do it in the pavilion because they said it might be too cold for some of the elders. And the pavilion was like an indoor kind of arena within the casino hotel complex. And then I was just told to be there. I wasn't sure exactly what was going to happen. What were you wearing during the apology ceremony? and? Was there a reason behind it? Yeah, I was wearing my old, like, Class A uniform jacket because I was a cavalryman. So I had my boots and I had my spurs and I had my Stetson that I got for, you know, being a spurred cav man. And I wore my old jacket. When was the last time you had worn your military outfit? Like, right before I got out of the military. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. So it had been a long time. So did someone suggest that this is what you should wear? No, I just thought, you know, I haven't put this stuff to any kind of use and I'm going out there because I used to be in the seventh cavalry. So yeah, I'm going to wear my old uniform. Did other veterans wear their old uniforms? Yeah. Plenty of people wear, oh, okay. wear pieces of their uniforms out when they do stuff, but I made sure it didn't have my rank on it or, you know, anything else because then you're impersonating an officer. And I was no longer an officer. And the ceremony begins and each of the elders gets up and they speak their piece and they lay out every, you know, sin that the United States has carried out against them. All the broken treaties, every massacre, taking children off to boarding schools, giving up the the Black Hills. 1868 treaty, 1851 treaty. 1889 treaty, June 24th, 1924, that we are come to be a citizen of the United States. That's where it's happened. That's where the team. That's why they want to lie. They make them live a lie. Just cultural destruction. I mean, their prayers and dances were even forbidden by law for decades. They lived eventually on the reservation through farming along the riverbanks. 
But then the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the 1940s seized all that prime land that they could farm on to build a big hydroelectric project. So even that was taken from them. And I hadn't slept and I hadn't really eaten anything. And I couldn't even believe I was still on my feet. And then I was supposed to say something. I just kind of blurted out whatever I thought the spirit was going to put in my mind. We came here to be the conscience of the nation. And we in that conscience, we must first confess our sins to you. Because many of us, me particularly, are from the units that have hurt you over the many years. We came, we fought you, we took your land, we signed treaties that we broke, we stole minerals from your sacred hills, we blasted the faces of our presidents onto your sacred mountain, and we took still more land, and then we took your children, and then we took, tried to take your language, and we tried to eliminate your language that God gave you and that the Creator gave you. We didn't respect you. We polluted your earth. We've hurt you in so many ways. And we've come to say that we are sorry. We are at your service and we beg for your forgiveness. And then I got down on my knees in front of Crow Dog and he was the, the older spiritual leader that was in the wheelchair and he put his hand on my head and told me, you know, go make world peace. As that finished, and it was like, okay, thanks everybody for coming. Go home now. It's all over. And we weren't sure, well, what is going on? And at that moment, like almost at that moment, this huge blizzard started to come in, like a bomb cyclone. And we had to evacuate the camp. Whiteout conditions on the main roads as this snow just literally covers them. You have to stop five miles an hour. Of course, you got a wind chill right now about minus 21 degrees. You get frostbite in about 30 minutes. And the only place for anyone to go was in the casino. And I remembered I stood outside with Phyllis Young as this bomb cyclone is hitting. And it felt like a tornado, like a blizzard tornado. So Phyllis was one of the elder Native American leaders at the protest. And she held her hands out as the snow hit it. And she looked at me and she said, this isn't even a real storm. And I'm like, what? She said, they engineered this storm. This is fake. They just made this. And I wasn't going to argue with her because I've already been around so many people that had so many ideas. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I, I think it's just a regular storm. So they evacuated as many people as they could from the camp and, and food and everything else. And they moved everyone into the casino. So you had people with all their stuff just in the halls sleeping and not sure how are we going to get everyone back. And Mike Wood had showed up the night before. So he and Sadef and a couple other people figured out, okay, we're going to pay for buses and we're going to bus everybody home. But the money hadn't cleared through GoFundMe yet. So they didn't really have the money to pay for buses or get anything going. And it was like total chaos. And I couldn't find anybody who was going to give me a ride to camp to help evacuate. So I wound up going from place to place within the hotel. And I had to always report to Phyllis. And she's like, we want you to write a letter to President Obama asking Leonard Peltier to be able to come home and serve out his sentence on the reservation. And Leonard Peltier was an activist who had been in jail since the 1970s and was part of the original American Indian movement. Leonard Peltier is a North American Indian he was tried in the United States and convicted of the killing of two FBI agents in a shootout on a South Dakota reservation. But big questions remain about FBI tactics during the trial. As a result, a campaign to win Pelche's freedom has involved church and government leaders in many parts of the world. And in the Soviet Union, Leonard Pelche is front page news. So 
I spent the day writing this letter for him, uh, something to send off to Obama, constantly checking in on what's going on. But I started to become conscious that there were people following me around. Like I kept seeing the same two or three vets and they didn't talk to me. They didn't shake my hand. They didn't ask for a picture, but they were always kind of in a room with their eye on me, no matter which room I went to. And there was always one of them near an exit to any main room, like just watching and not really talking to anyone else either, just alone. But everybody started to move into the casino and then the blizzard got worse and worse and worse. And as the day wound on, everything started to get stranger. The storm itself, we all were like, this fits into Black Elk's prophecy, like about the fighting the black snake, like that there'd be a huge storm and it would like bring everyone together and forge their bonds tighter. And that's what we were having happen. And I remember one of the crises was someone said a vet with PTSD who'd been in the camp had wandered off and his girlfriend was looking for him. And I found Mike Wood and I'm like, hey man, we need to rustle up like 50 vets or something like that and do, in the army, you do what's called a police line. So if somebody loses something like a weapon or whatever, you line up so everybody's like a shoulder width, their hands apart and you walk and you clear spaces of land like a grid square. So I'm like, let's find this guy before like he dies in this blizzard. And I'll never forget. And Mike Wood's like, why? I'm like, because the dude might die out there. It's like, listen, man, we're not in charge of anything. That's that guy's problem. This isn't the army. That guy's out here on his own and he's wandered off in the snow and it's his fucking problem. And I just could not get anybody to come with me to, to look for this guy and said, you know, don't worry about it. And of course, all the infiltrator talk heated up again and again and again. And then one of the guys from the Standing Rock talk, Sanderson, the guy who said, AIM is about to kill me, turned up in the casino saying, everybody's got to get out of here. They're going to get us all. And people are coming in from Bismarck. Like we stayed in the Holiday Inn and National Guard were kicking on our doors and calling us communists and say they were going to kill us. A journalist had come in who said they'd been run off the road by oil workers. This woman named Jen who'd volunteered, she came up and said she'd been attacked by two neo-Nazis who infiltrated and knocked one of her teeth out with like a soup can. It's like it was amping up everybody's kind of paranoia. And the next day, like it's all part of a blur through the fifth and the sixth. But at some point, like at probably two in the afternoon on the sixth, Travis is like, I got to show you something. I'm like, okay. He goes, got to be in private. And I was with Remy and Travis, the XO for our group till everybody rallies in there whose body's covered in a tattoo that all turns into a question mark in his chest. And Red Wolf Pope, the Chinese guy pretending to be a Native American medicine man. They'd all met up in my hotel room. And we go into the bathroom and Travis opens up his satchel bag and he takes out what looks like some kind of IED, improvised explosive device. It's like a bomb. and both Remy and Travis kept trying to get me to handle it and look at it and touch it to give them my opinion on what I thought it was. What did it look like? It looked like, like a shock absorber for a car that somebody had taken apart and then they put like caulking paste on it and then super glued a transistor to the outside of it. How big was it? Eight inches maybe in length. And it just looked completely fake to me. Now, for all I know, it could have been real. But to me, it was like, this is somebody's fake ass looking bomb they want me to touch. And I would not touch it. I would not put my hands on it. But I did not think it was an IED because there was no wire running from the transistor into anything else. But even a mock-up of a bomb is illegal. But I felt like they were trying to get my fingerprints on it to somehow bust me for something. Like I just felt that, like a, like a sixth sense. And I was like, oh, I'm not putting my fingers on that. And I thought, where did you find this? He goes, well, we, when we were looking for shrapnel on the bridge, like literally a day or two before I even arrived. And then in my head, I thought, so this guy's been carrying around what he wants to tell me he honestly believes is an IED in his satchel 
for four to five days before showing it to me? I'm like, no, not believing that. And also not touching that. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. You know, I'm not having anything to do with it. And Red Wolf was like, I'll find a way to get rid of it. And he took it and walked off. And even though that night before the thought had crossed my mind, like, I don't know, Travis and Sully from Adam, and they made me nervous. I, I always kept writing that off. Like I have PTSD and I'm just being paranoid. That was the first time it really hit me. Somebody here is not what they appear to be. And we have our staff meeting in the afternoon. And one of the guys was a smoke jumper and a pathfinder. And apparently there'd been a fire on the night of the 5th in the very tent that I'd set up with the wooden stakes. And he said, there's no way this fire happened naturally. He's like, there were two fires that started simultaneously in different places on the tent. And then the walls of the tent came down. And when the walls of the tent came down, there was a crew there with a satellite phone and cameras who took pictures of us. And I was like, that sounds insanely weird. We finished that meeting. There were some other minor crises where I had to run back and forth between groups of people. And then about four or five in the afternoon with, I can't remember this guy's name. He was like 6'3", super muscled, covered in like spiderweb tattoos. Like I would have thought he was a neo-Nazi if he wasn't hanging out with Heather, who was the purple haired trans internet security person we had. Just like, yeah, tiger swans, sometimes they infiltrate with medics. You know, there could be a bomb. So we searched all the medic areas for bombs to see if anything was there. Do you think that was a setup? Just those events one after the other, someone showing you something they say is a bomb and then someone else telling you bombs have been planted. When I look back on it, absolutely. At the time, not at all. It's like, holy shit, there's potentially one bomb and maybe more. And don't forget, I'd also been told neo-Nazis had already infiltrated and attacked somebody and that they'd then come here and, and blend it in. And I'm being followed at this point. And they're like, Christina something had, had disappeared. Like this, this woman who was part of our group had disappeared and they couldn't find her. And it had been three hours and they were worried that something happened to her because she said she thought someone was following her. So I'm like, fuck, I got to find her. Does part of you think, oh, someone is following me too. This is relevant to my situation. Yes and no. I figured like whatever's going to happen to me is going to happen to me. It doesn't matter. Like whatever God's on my side. If I'm meant to die, I'm meant to die. If not, whatever. So I go down to the front desk and I have the receptionist page this person. Because I'm like, obviously, if we have her page, whoever is looking for her or following her is going to immediately focus in on the front desk if someone pages her. When I paged the missing woman at the front desk, this guy named Squirrel, who'd been working in the, the talk, that little shack out there, your little mobile headquarters, led the pixie haircut woman in the purple puff jacket the dude with the green tattoo on his face and one other person to me at the front desk with a video camera as like a kind of interrogation thing. Like, you are a class enemy type of thing. And it just felt like super staged. And I probably answered a couple questions and apologized and like moved onward. So I see J.R. Redwater skipping through the lobby, joking with some like native elders. And I'm like, that is somebody I can trust because he's from here. And I immediately grabbed him like, dude, JR, I got to talk to you. And we wandered through the casino because I was being followed and we shook off whoever was following. And then he's like, there's cameras everywhere where we talk. Come here. We went into like the vending machine room and got down on our hands and knees like we're praying. But at the same time, we were whispering to each other. And he's like, tell me what's going on. And I told him what's going on. And he said, my cousin has worked security at the casino. Let's go talk to the casino security and tell them that this is a possibility and something to be on the lookout for. And we did. They're like, we'll totally be on the lookout for it. Like we're, we'll send our patrol that's walking through. We're going to be on the lookout for neo-Nazis, somebody placing a device, a bag that's totally unattended, something that looks suspicious. And I went back to where they said this safe room was, and all my stuff was gone. 
And I spend the next four hours walking around the hotel trying to find people I know to figure out what is happening, where is my stuff. And I'm supposed to leave the next day. Like I have a flight out like at noon the next day from Bismarck. I'm wondering how the hell am I going to get to Bismarck? And Mike Wood finds me and he's like, I heard you wrote some letter to get Peltier to serve out the rest of his sentence here on the reservation. I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, all the vets are super pissed off about that letter and you're no longer part of the organization, which I thought weird that a whole bunch of vets who went there to defend native rights would be upset that this guy would be able to serve his sentence out on his own reservation. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I still wrote the letter. You know, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care about being in charge of anything. And Milan had showed up. Milan's the guy, he hired me to write the Mike Milken script. And then I sat on his boat while we talked about the destruction of America for like two days. And we were I don't know, like 200 yards away from Abramovich's yacht. And I had told him, you know, dude, you said you missed out on Woodstock and like all the stuff in the 60s, like come out here and see this. This would be like a historic moment. And Milan came in when I was sitting at the bar, drinking a glass of water, at like four in the morning and really almost the only people up are the people following me. And I remember Milan told me, he goes, you made a big mistake, not being in control of the money. If you control the money, you control the organization. You made a big error. And I was like, I, you know what? I didn't see it as an error at all. And I'm like, I think I'm about to get killed. And he goes, what do you want to do about it? I'm like, well, I got a flight out like at noon from Bismarck. He goes, do you want to take a private plane or go out on the flight at noon? And I said, I want to get out of here right now. And he goes, let me see what we can do. Find who's coming with us. Let's go. And at five in the morning, I ran around looking for everybody. So. I find Trek, who I went out there with. And I'm like, dude, Trek, do you want to go like right now? He goes, okay. And I found Sully, who'd been sleeping outside in the SUV, and apparently had all my stuff. And Sadef found me and then publicly denounced me in front of a camera. And, you know, you're a coward. You're running scared. You are abandoning us. Even though I always told people I was leaving on Thursday. And I had no control of the money, and I'd already been fired from anything to do with the organization. And Sadef was the woman you became friends with the summer leading up to Standing Rock. That's right. Who was at your house almost every day. Mm -hmm. It felt like, at the time, I was like, this is like Game of Thrones meets The Truman Show. I knew something was fake. I didn't know what was fake. There seemed to be too many crises that were coming, and they were all kind of vague. But once you're in that and you have PTSD and you're in that emotional mindset, not to mention all the, the religious lunacy going through my head, from the afternoon of the 4th till I left on the morning of the 7th, I was being told straight up to my face, like, you're about to be killed. You're about to be this. Or having a fake bomb put on me every like two to three hours. And it's like, fuck, man. All right, I'm out of here. Like, missions accomplished. Like, whatever happened... With the ceremony, that must have been the mission. I'm done. I'm going home. And I'm not part of the organization anymore anyway. Milan, you know, we go into town in Mandan. It's my first time knowing anything that's been happening for the last week. It's been like a information black hole. Like I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't connect to the internet. I couldn't get updates from anyone. At, you know, it was like constant churn of chaos. And I suddenly realized that that apology ceremony had been shared a lot. Wes Clark Jr., the son of retired U.S. Army general and former Supreme Commander at NATO, Wesley Clark Sr., led military veterans in a ceremony Monday to ask forgiveness from Native Americans for the crimes of the U.S. military. A really beautiful ceremony just ended in there. There was a, a request for forgiveness by veterans. Here he is taking the opportunity to uh, address it and apologize. It. And we had breakfast in a diner and then Milan had to go like file some paperwork with the plane. So he drove over to the library. And as we're sitting in the back, I see the little sheriff, Sheriff Laney comes out of this like Chinese takeout food place with breakfast. And I get out of the car and I walk up to him I'm like Sheriff Laney. And he looks like I'm about to attack him. And I put my hand out and I said, you know, I just wanted to thank you for, you know, that you guys didn't attack us. 
And he shook my hand. And then I tried to explain to him, like, you understand, like, the way you have your guys set up. Like, you have guys set up in specific positions that hold historical meaning to the people on that reservation. And it brings back memories of, you know, basically getting slaughtered by the 7th Cavalry. It's like if somebody came to your church and desecrated the altar in your church, how would you feel about it? He goes, I'd be pretty upset. I'm like, that's what you guys are doing out there. He said, okay, well, I'll take it under consideration. And this uh, friend of Milan's took a photo of it. And then that ran in the like LA Times when they did a story. But then we got in the car. Blizzard was even worse. Like when we were on the road, like we almost didn't make it to, I think we flew out of Wyandotte or something. It's like several hours in a blizzard driving. Then Milan had rented this plane. I got home, was like overjoyed that I was home. And then my wife is immediately like, what the fuck did you do? Everybody's furious at you. You abandon all these guys. And it's like, I had no money. I'd been kicked out of the group. I mean, there was nothing. I was already scheduled to leave that day. Where was she getting her information? Well, she was tied in with this whole network of people because I was completely out of contact for like a week. And so she was answering all these calls and messages and everything else. And she helped get buses out there. And then the bus drivers, like, we're going to take off. And some of the heaters didn't work and some of them broke down. But I was also under massive information attack. So all over Twitter, there was this like hashtag, where's the money, Wes? because they accused me of running off with like a million dollars in donations. Like, oh, I got all my money. I'm out of here. And I didn't have any money. Like literally I had like $300 left in the bank. And I didn't know how I was even going to get through the next month. But then also I saw this site called, it's like the People's Progressive, whatever, like online magazine. But they were kind of a key kind of tiger swan fake news outfit, which I didn't understand until months later. And on the front of it was Clark abandons like Standing Rock, runs off with the money. And there's a picture of the tent that there was a fire in at night from the angle of the guy with the sat phone. All ready to go, uploaded, story ready, information op ready. And I realized then like I've been massively targeted. And now I'm going to get destroyed. So suddenly there were like thousands of angry tweets and Facebook death threats and everything else that I'd absconded with this money that I'd never had any connection to whatsoever. While many of those Twitter posts have been taken down, of the early ones that remain, most of them were pushed by accounts that are now pushing COVID disinformation. One of the first accounts to post the Where's the Money West hashtag belonged to a man named Lauren Schofield, who, according to online records, worked for Silverton Consulting International, the same company as the mercenary who pulled out an AR-15 at Standing Rock while posing as a protester. I mean, I was literally kicked out of the group. (laughs) And I left on the day I was always scheduled to leave. Oh, man. I mean, literally within, I think, two or three days of my coming back from Standing Rock. The weed guy, the pot grower I met through the Australian, who I was trying to get a medical marijuana business off the ground with. He had wanted me to come after Standing Rock to meet Rick Perry, was putting on some event in Las Vegas. And Rick Perry is the former governor of Texas who would become Trump's energy secretary. And he's like, oh, dude, you got to come meet Rick Perry. Like, come on, it'll be good. You can talk to him about climate change. And after that, he he called me up and he goes, holy shit, dude, like people want to kill you. And I'm like, what? He goes, dude, all these fucking three percenters and militia guys, they all want to kill you for apologizing to the Native Americans. He goes, I had to talk people out of finding you and killing you. Why is he hanging out with the, the three percenters? He ran into them at the Perry event, not just like random people in Vegas. So it's like these groups have been embedded with the Republican Party even before Trump came to power. So I had to answer thousands of messages when I got back. And I just dove right into doing that and trying to figure out how to help from my end to get people evac out of there and back home. And 
to try and figure out what was go- what was going on with the money. And what happened with the money in the GoFundMe account? Because at this point, they should be able to use it, right? Well, by this point, you know, Sadef sends me some of the financial records. She sent me paperwork that showed that he kept like, I don't know, something like three hundred fifty or four hundred thousand dollars was still sitting in those accounts. And I'd written him and been like, you need to account for the money and it needs to be like given to the tribe or legal defense to, for water protectors or something. And it's like, mm, you don't get a say in anything because you don't have any control over it. You're not part of, part of the group. So no one was spending it. I don't, I didn't think so. It was just sitting in the account still. I had no idea what they were doing with it because nobody was communicating me except for Sedef occasionally. I read in the Bismarck Tribune that on the night of I believe November 30th, the night before we're all supposed to start mustering in, a cloud seeding plane crashed at two in the morning, 15 miles north of the reservation. Cloud seeding is where you dump a, like a powdered, like aluminum mixture into the air that then ice crystals form around it and you create a rainstorm. What? The Chinese did it for the Olympics, if you remember, in, uh, when they were hosted in Beijing. And most states have cloud seeding planes that are used occasionally in agricultural states where they just absolutely need to produce a storm. Fascinating. I know. I was surprised by it too. I'm like, no way. But yeah, no, it's a real thing. And I was like, what would a cloud seeding plane be doing up in December at two in the morning, 15 miles north of the reservation? And then I remembered when Phyllis was standing outside in the crazy blizzard on the afternoon of the 5th, and she said, you know, this isn't a real storm. They made this. And I thought, remember? And I thought, that's that's totally ridiculous. And then I read this article, and I was like, holy shit, man. They, like, created a blizzard. And they'd already had all the propaganda ready to go for the blizzard, which was deliver the tents with wooden pegs. Put it in this location. When the blizzard comes in, light it on fire, have the crew there, have the story ready to go about abandoning vets in a blizzard. And it was like, when that, when I read that, it suddenly hit me. Sorry, when you say they, you mean? The mercenary companies that are hired to protect the pipeline, that are, that run it like a, you know, a war operation against American citizens exercising their right to free expression and association. So you remember my old friend, Dave. How did you know Dave? He was my best friend back in like 2000. Went on to become a director. He completely destroyed my career. Oh. So when I returned home from Standing Rock, I was under information attack for like really intense for the first 48 hours. And one of the accounts sent a picture of him in his director chair. So you were tagged. I was tagged. In the tweet. So they wanted you to see it. Yeah. And did this account have a lot of followers? Not many. Was there anything Dave said to you in the time you knew him before Standing Rock that was a red flag? Yeah, like the time he said he used to be a bill collector for Scientology. And he was always a right winger. He would get drunk and he would call and there'd be like a two hour homophobic message on the other end of the line. So you'd wake up in the morning, you'd hear, are you gay? Are you gay? Do you suck cock? Are you gay? One of the last things he told me when we'd been friends in like 2006 was that he got himself kicked out of the Navy after his first submarine cruise, that he received an other than honorable discharge because he smoked pot so that he wouldn't have to go back on the cruise because he'd been hazed, which to me was mind blowing. Does part of you worry that you suspect Dave as being part of the operation because you associate him with the trail? Partially. I mean, I'm, I'm suspicious of all of my assumptions because a lot of them come from an emotional place and not a logical place. But there's so many coincidences and things. Two of his movies were financed by a guy named Michael Lesson. He was a Russian guy who built RT. What is RT? RT is essentially a Russian propaganda television network that operates in the United States. In 2015, Lesson was found beaten to death in his hotel room in Washington, D.C., and he was about to be questioned by the FBI the next day about money laundering the movie business. And the FBI said, had to have been a suicide, even though he died from multiple blunt force trauma to the head. I mean, at least on IMDb, that's who financed these movies. And I saw that his next movie was funded by Steve Mnuchin, 
we should note that it's actually Lesson's son who is credited as the executive producer on those films. But we should also note it is standard practice for wealthy Russians to move money through their children, and that his son's producing career seems to have largely ended upon his father's death. It should also be noted that the Russian-backed entity which financed David's films also financed a film made by Oliver Stone, the father of Sean Stone, who helped pull Wes into Standing Rock. Remember how we mentioned that David had pulled Wes into a CIA screenwriting group? Well, it's been reported that David was in another group doing similar work with the Pentagon. Another member of that group was Oliver Stone. While it's entirely possible this is just a coincidence, Ayer had also been attached to remake the Oliver Stone picture Scarface. In what could also be purely a coincidence, in the two years after Standing Rock, David Ayer was also in talks to work on two projects with actor and director Mel Gibson, who was the funder behind the Lip TV, which employed both Sean Stone and Wesley Clark Jr. in the lead up to Standing Rock. While we could not tie David directly to Tiger Swan, we were able to find multiple photographs of him and a man named Howard Mullen, who refers to David as a close friend. Mullen ran a military-focused media organization which heavily promoted Tiger Swan and which Tiger Swan advertised in. There's another detail about David's career which also seems coincidental. In the three years after Wes's Standing Rock experience, David would be attached to produce one television series about private military contractors and another about Co-Intel Pro, which was an FBI program to infiltrate and subvert left-wing activist movements throughout the 1950s and 60s. And I didn't even know that. So you've got a right-wing guy obsessed with being on the inside and mind-fucking people who'd been hired by the government as a contractor coming up with war games on how to destroy America. And all these guys at the mercenary organizations, almost all of them started out working in the government. So it would have been a pretty natural transition. And then I went and I did the Young Turks. Special surprise guest, a living legend, Wes Clark Jr. The cavalry has arrived back at Rebel headquarters. What's up, dude? How you doing, brother? Hi, Wes. Hey. <laughs> I got in like late last night and, uh, I hadn't been online in about two weeks, so my mind was kind of blown this morning. <laughs> Did you have any sense of the magnitude of the coverage and what? None, none. Two, they, what they thought was 2,000 veterans, turned out to be 4,000 veterans, are gonna show up. All of a sudden, the Army Corps is a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, uh, open to discussion. I'd All love to know the Army Corps guy uh, who decided not to kick us off and to do the easement, to cancel the easement, because he probably saved a lot of people's lives. And I was still in that crazy fucking Enoch mode. You've got nothing to lose. Because in eight years, if we don't do this, the world is going to start dying. And you'll be around when it happens. So you have nothing to lose. You don't have to worry about losing your freedom. You don't have to worry about losing your life. Because it's going to end anyway. What I didn't realize was Cenk edited out like 20 minutes of it where I said we were, we were infiltrated by Tiger Swan and other mercenary companies, and he cut all of that out, which made me paranoid after I'd learned he'd cut those things out. But then I went back to his office after the show, and he's like, listen, it's, you know, I want you to be involved in Justice Democrats. We're going to be launching this whole thing, and, you know, you might want to run for something, and we're going to give you your own show. And, and I was like, First, I had this huge bowl of ice cubes in front of me that I was eating like popcorn. And I, I was telling him with a straight face, I'm like, I'm Enoch. I'm one of the two witnesses to the end of time. And I announced the apocalypse on your show tonight. And he just looked at me like, okay, so is that Coke or Pepsi you'd like? Like he just took it all matter of fact, like as if there was nothing in the world wrong. As I kept babbling on. And Do you I was think like, he was just like, okay, crazy person? You know, kind of how you were when James Martinez told you the spirit of Russell Means wanted you at Standing Rock? Yeah, no, totally. Like, absolutely. And I was like, I can't do a show. I can't run for office. I can't do any of these things because it wasn't me that did any of this stuff. It was God. And if I try and take credit for it, I'm doing something wrong. Why the ice cubes? I have no idea. 
But when I was in that like Enoch mode, I would like, <laughs> just, I mean, I would just eat them like popcorn. That's so bizarre. Totally bizarre. So Enoch is Metatron or are they? Enoch is Metatron. And at the point I thought is also me. And as I'm sitting at home, then I get a call from General Russell Honore, which kind of blew my mind because I'd never met General Honore before and I'd never spoken to him before and I'd never given him a number. Who is this general? This is General Russell Honore is the general in charge of the January 6th, you know, report on the insurrection. He's the guy who took charge of the recovery from Hurricane Katrina when it hit New Orleans. He's a good guy. And he calls me up and he's like, boy, you don't know how close you were to dying. I'm like, what, sir? He goes, well, I'm retired engineer corps and you was going to die. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I was one of the Corps of Engineer Generals who lobbied with some other retired Corps of Engineer Generals to prevent an attack on the camp while you were there. But apparently they were going to attack camp while we were there. And General Honore told me that he and a couple other retired engineer corps generals, they're the ones who pushed Obama to deny the easement. And to prevent violence? To prevent violence. What did you think when he said that? I thought, wow, I came just as close to death as I thought I was. <laughs> and from what I understand, your situation actually got significantly more intense in the months after Standing Rock. A hundred percent. Next week, we'll hear what else happened to you as you came back from Standing Rock. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back next week with more American PSYOP. American PSYOP is a Bunker Crew media production in collaboration with Midas Touch. It was edited and directed by Jack Bryan. Our producers are Stacey Scher, Marley Clements, and Jack Bryan. Executive producers are Ben Mysalis and Grant D. Simone. Sound design by Joy Ellett. I'm your co-host, Emily Bix. Please join us again next time.